Hi everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here, coming to you from the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. We begin this new year, 2012, Year of the Dragon, well, starting January 23rd, that is, with uh, part eight of our Deng Xiaoping overview. I guess this eight-part series was a good way to sort of get a chance to revisit different periods of Chinese history through the context of Deng Xiaoping's life. We touched on a lot of new things that hadn't been covered before, and I keep mentioning we're going to circle back another day and focus in on some of the things we just skimmed over, like uh, Xi Zhongxun from the last episode. He deserves a whole podcast, and we'll cover him another day. As I mentioned, he's the father of Xi Jinping, who, barring anything unforeseen, like the end of the world, is slated to be named the new president of China and party secretary. He's also a vice chairman of the CMC, the Central Military Commission, and it's no secret he's going to get that top spot, too. So, we covered a lot these past seven weeks, and there's plenty to come back to another day. So let's finish off this Deng Xiaoping overview. And we're picking up today after Deng hit a series of rough patches in 1988 and 89. Inflation hit the country hard. And then there was the June 4th incident, and this put a huge damper, not only on China's image worldwide, but also caused a huge rift between the government and the esteem the people felt for it. No, these weren't good days for Deng. After plodding forward for a decade, dodging bullets and Chen Yun's go-slow faction, always pushing back from the other direction, Deng's reforms were really having a very big impact wherever they were put in effect. Guangdong and Fujian provinces were the first major beneficiaries of the reforms, but by the 1990s, the whole country was catching the bug. Once China's economy hit the skids, this gave Chen Yun and his faction carte blanche to put in a whole wave of measures that really put a damper on the reforms. Chen gets credit, though, in putting his policies in place for dealing with the wretched inflation problem that hit everyone hard. Following the Tiananmen June 4th incident, Deng knew he was going to have to take his lumps with all the international elites in the West. Everyone in the West let China have it. There were sanctions, speeches, you name it. It was a politician's dream. And wherever there was a grandstand to go preach on, leaders and politicians around the world expressed outrage about the events that had happened. But Deng knew this would pass. And sure enough, 17 months after the tanks rolled into Tiananmen, the U.S. needed China's vote for the first Persian Gulf War. And after Chen Shih-chen helped us out at the U.N., things very soon after went right back to where they had left off. Nonetheless, Tiananmen was really a sideshow to the main problem of inflation and hard times in China, caused by the imprudent lifting of price controls. It was right after the June 4th incident that Deng told his fellow party leaders that he was stepping aside and clearing the decks for the next generation of leaders, the third generation of which we know Jiang Zemin served as the core of this generation. At the fourth plenum of the 13th Party Congress, June 23rd, 24th, 1989, all the leaders, including Deng, got an attaboy and a pat on the back for quelling the student protests that culminated in the June 4th incident. Jiang was officially made party secretary. The transition of power from Deng to Jiang from the second generation to the third was now in progress. And later in August of that year, 1989, Deng met with his old allies, Yang Shang Kun and Wang Jun, and told them that at the next plenum, he was going to pass the CMC position to Jiang as well. And with that, he would be totally removed from government. And at the fifth plenum in November... That's indeed what happened. Now, Deng didn't give everything up. He kept his title as honorary chairman of China's Bridge Association. Deng loved that game. Ezra Vogel says that on September 4th, 1989, Deng called all the main leaders to his house. And there, Deng let everyone know his retirement plans. There he told the assembled heavyweights of the time, Jiang Zemin, Li Peng, Qiao Shi, Yao Yilin, Song Ping, Li Rei Huan, Yang Shang Kun, and Wan Li, all the stars of the 80s and 90s, to keep opening up, stay committed to reform, keep the party strong, and in control at all costs. And last but not least, he said, 
Let's ditch the Central Advisory Commission. You see, the way Deng saw it, if he was retiring, all those other guys, the Chen Yun, Deng Li Chins of the party, hardliners, they had to go too. And since their little club for these conservatives who always had their foot on the brake when Deng was trying to drive the country forward was called the Central Advisory Commission, the Zhongyang Guwen Wei Yuan Hui. Remember, it, it got set up in 1982 after Chen Yun's insistence at the 12th CPPCC, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. This was the check to balance Deng's unfettered drive towards reform and economic development, and of course, the whole opening up thing. The two top guys were Deng and Chen Yun, and the other members of this most elite of clubs in China were the so-called Eight Immortals of the party. These were Peng Zhen, Yang Shangkun, Bo Yi Bo, Li Xiannian, Wang Zheng, and Song Renqiong. So Deng said, I'm going and you're all coming with me. And that was that. At the next party congress in 1992, they were all retired and this commission was done away with. Deng had sent a letter to the Politburo, sort of a, an official farewell message. In it, he said, and I quote from uh, Vogel's book, the core leadership headed by comrade Jiang Zemin has been working very efficiently. After careful consideration, I should like to resign my current posts while I am still in good health. This will be good for the party, the state, and the army. Since I am an old citizen and a veteran party member who has worked for decades for the communist cause and for the independence, reunification, development, and reform of the country, my life belongs to the party and the country. After my retirement, I shall continue to be devoted to the cause. As the reform and opening up to the outside world have only just begun, our task is arduous and our road will be long and tortuous but I am certain we shall be able to surmount all difficulties and that one generation after another will advance the cause pioneered by the first generation. The world found out about Deng's official retirement when American Nobel laureate T.D. Lee, Li Changdao, visited Deng. Even though Deng was retired, he still selectively saw some visiting foreign VIPs, dignitaries. Despite being shunned at first by various foreign nations, Deng still kept a brave and friendly face on when he met with, you know, whatever big shot or somebody who was in town. T.D. Lee was a great American of Chinese descent who won the Nobel Prize for Physics when he was 30 years old, the youngest American ever to receive the coveted honor. So when Dr. Lee met with Deng, the beans were spilled about his stepping down. It was pretty big international news. And so at the Fifth Plenum on November 7th, the CMC chairmanship was passed to Jiang Zemin, and this symbolically marked Deng's formal stepping down from government and party service. Deng bid everyone farewell. And as he waved to the assembled leaders and members on that day, it was just barely shy of seven decades since he had landed in France right after the May 4th movement, when everything was just a dream. So Deng, he went out in style, and although he had his detractors, no one who stood and applauded for him could deny him the respect and admiration he was due. The next day, he posed for pictures with everyone who got to come and shake the great man's hand, and then the next day, the Berlin Wall fell. Well, U.S.-China relations were really not in a good place, you know, all because of June 4th. But Deng used his old relationships with George Bush 41 and Brent Scowcroft and Dr. Kissinger, of course, to keep that door open. And little by little, by 1993, 94, things, of course, also due to the tireless work of Qian Chi Chen, began to thaw. I had just moved to Hong Kong three months after Tiananmen, and the mood was totally sour. The outfit I worked for is a huge cut-and-sew manufacturer, where we were always getting ragged on and the faxes from... Customers who, you know, gave us their two cents about this, about that. And it was not well received at all in China when, in 1990, thanks to Western influence, China's hopes to host the 2000 Olympics were torpedoed. But of course, they got the 2008 Beijing Olympics. But things were normal, but there was always this gray cloud hanging over southern China during those years. 
1989, 90, 91. I remember by 1994, though, when the World Cup was held in the U.S., it was pretty much business as usual. I was traveling all over China selling World Cup bags and merchandise made by my factory, and it was as if the past five years had never happened. But if you recall, 1988, 89, 90, not good years for communism, and the established order in the Eastern Bloc nations had been smashed and was in the process of reinventing itself. All this dovetailed wonderfully with what was going on in China. No one could point a finger at China. Hey, the doors were wide open there, and all kinds of changes were going on, and the foreign press always loved to print stories about how the people were lifting themselves out of poverty thanks to all the reforms, and of course, the opening up aspect. <laughs> the the documentaries and movies and TV specials, you name it, they took full advantage of the opening up of China. People in the U.S. just ate this up. Nonetheless, in the face of this meltdown in the communist world, especially in the soon-to-be former Soviet Union, things were getting dicey at the topmost layer of leadership in China. August 20th, 1991, Deng meets with Jiang Zemin, Li Peng, and others at the top and urges them to stick together, don't back down or succumb to pressure. He, in so many words, said, we're safe from all this because we already opened up and everyone can see, despite the economic slowdown, what's going on here. We're moving in the right direction, so they can't say jack. And China embraced the changes going on in the world, recognizing the three Baltic republics after they broke away from the Soviet Union. And Russia, of course, as soon as the new Russian state was announced, China was right there with recognition and congratulations. Deng knew China was in danger of getting run over by this truck that was rolling all over Eastern Europe and Russia. He firmly believed if the Communist Party was going to dodge this bullet, the Chinese economy was going to have to be opened up faster and more risks taken. This, Deng knew, would sort of inoculate China against the worst of the foreign finger pointers, would at the same time offer a heck of a lot of new incentives to common people who wanted to take advantage of some of the things that offered all kinds of economic benefits to themselves and their families. So Deng needed to speed up growth. He knew this was the only way to bounce back from all the economic bad news since 1988 and then exacerbated by the sanctions and flight of Western investment right after June 4th, 1989. Deng believed if China continued to stand still, it would mean the end of the party. And who knows what might happen in China with no one at the helm. But there was only one problem. No one, not even Jiang Zemin, would side with Deng. The prevailing attitude in the Politburo, at least, was don't do anything rash. Keep it slow, steady and continue to wait things out before taking on a new wave of careful reforms. Deng felt if they did this, just sit around and wait, it would in time present a whole ghastly political problem to the CCP, and the people might just rise up and throw them out. So he had to take matters into his own hands. Couldn't his fellow leaders at the top see what happened in Russia, Poland, and Romania with Ceausescu, and elsewhere... A Chinese economy that was firing on all eight cylinders would take everyone's attention off the bad stuff. Chairman Mao, back in 1965, when he couldn't get any respect, and when he saw the country, in his eyes anyways, going down the tubes, he sidestepped the government, went down to Wuhan, and took that famous swim across the Yangtze that symbolically showed the Chinese people that he was back. Deng Xiaoping did the same thing in 1992. Unable to reason with Chen Yun and the central planners, he did the equivalent of Mao's swim. But Deng instead took a family vacation. And whatever you see today as far as China at its best, at its most modern, most spectacular, whatever you see in Shanghai and Pudong, that all came about from this little Deng family vacation. It seemed like such an innocent and innocuous thing, but it was anything but that. Cloaking this trip like he did and hiding behind this facade of a family getaway to Wuhan, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, and Shanghai turned out to be one of the most brilliant political moves 
Even Zhuge Liang, Cao Cao, and Sun Tzu himself would have admired Deng's secret plan. By the end of 1991, the push and pull between Deng and Chen Yun had become too great. No matter what was said that called for faster reform, Chen Yun and his proxies would automatically call for the opposite. These were the days where there were constant warnings and buzz in the air about spiritual pollution and peaceful evolution, you know, all of which meant nothing except bad news for the CCP. So as I said, Deng couldn't get anywhere. He was 87 years old and running out of time. His health was starting to fail. He was running out of breath. It was now or never. So Deng and his whole extended family of 17, except the youngest son, Deng Zhifang, who I had the pleasure of meeting back in 1995, they all piled into a special train. And on January 17th, Benjamin Franklin's birthday, 1992, Deng left Beijing. No one in the leadership knew at first. Deng arrived at the first stop on the very next day. This was the great revolutionary city of Wuhan in Hubei province. And if no one paid much heed to Deng's family vacation, when the Wuhan party Shu Ji, or secretary, met Deng at the train station, Deng didn't mince words, and he said, whoever is against reform must leave office. Now, he didn't say this in any official capacity, nor were there any TV cameras rolling, but Jiang Zemin did find out quickly that Deng had skipped town and was on his way south with his wife, kids, spouses, and grandchildren. And no doubt, Jiang Zemin made sure that whatever Deng uttered to anyone be reported back to him verbatim. So when Jiang heard such a provocative statement as that, Deng had his attention. You see, Jiang was a Deng man. But he was also a cautious man. He sort of sat on the fence and didn't side with Deng, but also didn't side against him. But after he heard what Deng said in Wuhan, two days later, he put on his cheerleader's uniform and was out there saying we should move faster and open up more and pick up the pace of reform. Next stop on the tour was Changsha, where Deng gave the same message. Stop sitting around, speed up the economic development of Changsha. Next stop was the big one, the main event. I can remember it like it was yesterday. January 19th morning. Deng arrives in Guangzhou, and he's met by the top brass down there, including Xie Fei, the Shu Ji, or party secretary of uh, Guangdong, and Shen Zhen's party secretary, Li Hao. He goes down there and starts an 11-day whirlwind inspection tour of Shenzhen and Zhuhai. You have to hand it to all these officials down in Guangdong. They had scant time to prepare for this visit, and no one knew what to make of some Deng family vacation. But all of a sudden, when word got out about what Deng was calling for in Wuhan and Changsha, they knew what the deal was. And this was a serious visit disguised as a family vacation. In fact, by now, everyone knew this whole family vacation thing was a sham and that Deng was making an end run around Chen Yun and the conservatives. If no one in the government had the guts to do what had to be done, Deng Xiaoping, soon pushing 90 years old, was going to have to fight one last fight before passing from this world. One thing to recall, Deng had made a similar trip to the South back in 1984, where he proclaimed the initial success of the SEZs and that this whole crazy idea was the correct one, and most of the same guys were still around. And they saw how Deng had been the savior to Guangdong province and had made it the envy of all China. And these fellas had been laying low, chomping at the bit, and all those entrepreneurial hormones running wild down there. But since 1988, Deng's reform policies were scaled back, and all the things that used to be okay now weren't okay. So once these officials down in Guangdong saw what Deng was up to, they embraced this with gusto, and together they all went down to Shenzhen to go check out the scene firsthand. They had nothing to hide. Sure, some of the negative influences, or negative from their point of view, had wafted into southern China from across the border in Hong Kong. You see, back then, in those pre-broadband days, late 80s, early 90s, this was all pre-internet. When Deng made his grand southern tour in 1992... You didn't even have dial-up. I mean, we were still barely in a 28, 56 KB world. 
No internet yet to despoil the sensibilities of all Chinese. But there was one thing. One thing that couldn't be stopped. That was called ATV and TVB. You remember TVB? Television Broadcast Limited? That was the company formerly owned by Sir Run Run Shaw, who we featured in China History Podcast, episode 49. These were Hong Kong's two television stations. Now, TVB Jade and ATV Home... This is where all the action was on Hong Kong TV. Foreigners listened to the English stations, TVB Pearl and ATV World. But given the Chinese to Lao Wai ratio in the Pearl River Delta region, all the action was with the two competing Chinese stations, Jade and Home. Most all the programming was in Cantonese. But hey, no big deal. Everyone just across the border spoke the same dialect. You can put borders and fences in place all you want, but television signals, no, no boundaries. And for as long as there were TVs with rabbit air antennas, the southernmost Chinese had been picking up Hong Kong TV for years. Most of us may take TV for granted, having grown up with it as an integral part of our lives, and how we received news and entertainment. Well, this was not a common thing in China in 1992, but those who had access to televisions first were the Cantonese. And they were way more savvy than their northern brothers and sisters. They got to hear the Hong Kong version of events, and they got to enjoy this very, very handy window to the outside world. See, late 1980s China was wide open, of course, but it hadn't reached the point, you know, where common folk and young'uns were practically chartering whole 747s to go on these vacations all over the world. China wasn't at that stage yet. This was all along, or so the top leaders in Beijing thought, supposed to be a low-key trip. According to the rules, Deng had to obey certain protocols about, you know, who he saw and what he said. But here he was, Deng Xiaoping, the most famous and powerful guy in China, albeit retired, down in the south. It took only a few days for word to leak out and cross the border into Hong Kong. And then before you knew it, there was a massive flood of reporters making their way from Hong Kong to Shenzhen. And the news cycle in Hong Kong was nonstop Deng Xiaoping. And if you had more than a few brain cells, it didn't take long to learn. This was not a family vacation, but a political maneuver by Deng to fight back against the conservative, anti-reform, and anti-opening up faction and push start the whole Chinese economy. It was a news sensation. It was reported in Hong Kong first, and then the TV signals were received loud and clear from TVB and ATV across the border into southern China. And from there, it spread like wildfire. None of China's leaders in Beijing had thought about this possibility. Everyone up in Beijing were no doubt pacing the halls in their villas in Zhongnanhai, wondering how to respond to this and what this might mean to them. Deng Xiaoping was 87 when he and his family took in the sights of Guangdong, when these officials guided him through all the great things that had happened so far in Shenzhen. And they kept saying the same thing. You know, if we could just be allowed to do this and do that again, you know, like before, you know, and it was like preaching to the choir. Deng was able to take in the situation there and see for himself that these guys were being held back and some of this regulation and prohibition had to be scaled back and gotten rid of entirely. So every morning, Dung got up and, you know, hung out with these guys for about three hours. He was taken to various places where he either toured factories or took in the sights with his family. Then he'd head back to his guest house where, you know, the family was staying and take a nice afternoon nap and relax. I can't imagine what it must have been like for all these guys down in Guangdong who were orchestrating this whole opera. Everything Dung said was, you know, go, 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 don't slow down, you're doing great, do better, take more risks, correct mistakes, move on. He even said Shenzhen should try to catch up economically with the four dragons of Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea, in 20 years. And of course, these Guangdong officials are looking north to Beijing and saying like, you know, well, you know, what do you got to say about that? After five days of pounding the same drumbeat, Deng headed to the other SEZ of Zhuhai, which bordered the still Portuguese enclave of Macau, where Party Secretary Liang Guangda was 
ready and waiting to have his turn with the great man. The same message repeated every day in Shenzhen was repeated in Zhuhai. Deng went through the same drill, witnessing all the greatest hits of Shenzhen and Zhuhai, the tallest buildings, model factories, mingling with the Lao Bai Xing. It was a public relations coup. It was during this Zhuhai stop along the southern tour that Deng reiterated again the same provocative statements he had made in Wuhan. Whoever wasn't on the side of reform should leave the government. And then, to really put Jiang Zemin's feet to the fire, Deng had a little meeting with some major heavyweights in the army, namely his close friends, the Yang brothers, Yang Shangkun and Yang Bai Bing, as well as the military giant Liu Huaqing. These were three sacred cows in the Chinese military, and they all met with Deng to discuss, ostensibly, military planning. What else? But the interesting thing was that this meeting in Zhuhai was chaired by an interesting guy from Shanghai named Qiao Shi. Qiao Shi was the top guy in China in charge of domestic security matters. That means the Gong An was under his big umbrella. The Gong An, that was the PSB, Public Security Bureau. Well, Chiao Shi, he was a standing committee member, which made him one of the most powerful guys in all of China. And if there was anyone, anyone at all on the standing committee who might possibly pose any kind of political threat to Jiang Zemin, it was this guy. And everyone at this meeting, the top military guys, Chiao Shi, Deng, of course, they were all in lockstep about the need to speed up reform. Otherwise, China would never shake loose of this economic stagnation that had been keeping China down for four years already. Well, if President Jiang Zemin wasn't feeling totally secure in his job about now, that was understandable. When Deng finished making his point in Zhuhai, the next step was the provincial capital and historic city of Guangzhou, and then afterwards the Deng traveling circus went to Shanghai, but Deng stopped briefly in Yingtan, a city that had once played a role in Deng's personal history. As you recall from the Deng Xiaoping podcast episode number four, Deng had been sent down to Jiangxi to cool his heels and exercise his humility during some of the most heated years of the Cultural Revolution. It was surely touching for Deng to be back there. Yingtan is a little south and east of Nanchang in Jiangxi province. It was in the early 30s that Deng also served the CCP cause in Jiangxi. Well, next stop, as I said, was Shanghai. Shanghai is the New York City of China. The potential there, as far as the industriousness and resourcefulness of the people, was, of course, legendary. Going back to the earliest days, before the Tang Dynasty, these Jiangnan people, the people south of the Great River, the Changjiang, or Yangtze River, but the Shanghainese included in that group, of course, they had been paying for all these historical embarrassments that characterized the bad old days of Shanghai that followed the fall of the Qing dynasty. The CCP had been extremely wary and mistrustful of the Shanghainese, and when it came time for opening up to the outside world and launching these reforms and SEZs, Shanghai was purposely left out of the party. Deng had been pushing for the development of Shanghai since early 1990. He knew nothing except great things could come from developing Shanghai and turning all that pent-up energy there into economic achievements. Naturally, no one on the conservative side was too eager to expand the reforms. But Jiang Zemin and his replacement down in Shanghai, Zhu Rongji, both of those guys, one from Jiangsu and one from Hunan, had made their mark in the party in Shanghai, and if Deng wanted to do in Shanghai what had already been experimented with in Guangdong and Fujian, well, they were all for it. Well, now their chance was coming, and now Deng was coming to town. There were some very high hopes that someone was finally going to shake loose and get these manacles off Shanghai business and economic development, and that Shanghai would soon get the same benefits enjoyed by their southern cousins in Shenzhen, Shantou, Xiamen, and Zhuhai. But before Shanghai had any chance of getting some badly needed preferential treatment and special government backing, these cautious types in the government, who wouldn't let their hands off the brake, they had to let up. 
Someone had to push these guys aside first before Shanghai had the slightest prayer of enjoying what their Shenzhen cousins got to enjoy. So, on February 3rd, 1992, after Jiang Zemin called Deng Xiaoping to wish him a Happy New Year, that suddenly Jiang saw the light. And you know what? He suddenly came down off his fence and said, this reform thing is good and we should continue it. And Deng remained in Shanghai for a few weeks, and it was there where he sort of took stock of everything that had happened over the past you know, period during the Southern Tour. And he did in Shanghai what he did in Shenzhen and Zhuhai. He took in the sights and got the lay of the land, what was going down in Shanghai, and what kind of miracles might happen if they were given some special treatment. Deng promised to fight for them, which he did. Deng said, although Shanghai had started late, they would reap all the benefits of all the lessons learned from all the mistakes that were made along the way down in Guangdong. February 21st, 1992, Deng returned to Beijing. The groundswell of support coming not only out of Guangdong and Shanghai, but elsewhere as well, was simply too great for Jiang Zemin. He had received Deng Xiaoping's message loud and clear and had decided to hop on the bus rather than get run over. And the conservatives, they tried to do what they could to play this down, but there was too much buzz in the air, too much excitement, and too little support for the old ideas. All kinds of measures were being taken to suppress the news about this trip, but it was impossible. Too much had already gotten out and had spread too far and wide. And the mood on the street was almost universally in support for what Deng was calling for. So going against this tide was suicidal. And that, I guess, was the whole purpose for this trip in the first place. By March of that year, everybody was on board and the excitement not only in China, but in Hong Kong as well. I can remember it clearly. After all these years of being stuck in a rut and after the reverberations of June 4th quieted down, the country was ready and everybody climbed on board. And, well, you know, what you see today, all over China, that's what ended up happening as a result. And Jiang Zemin, in the months that followed, he really became the chief cheerleader, calling for bolder and faster reforms. And in July, after giving a eulogy for Li Xianyan, who had just passed away, even Chen Yun himself had come out and gave his wholehearted support for Deng's policies and said times had changed and these new times required new thinking and even he was lined up with Deng and the reformers. Well, there wasn't much else to do after this. All that was left was the 14th Party Congress that was held October 12th to 18th, 1992. Deng didn't attend and therefore wasn't present to see everything he fought for turned into official policy, and to hear all the leaders sing his praises. Jiang Zemin was totally lined up behind Deng on this, and whatever Jiang Zemin said, the rest of the party had to walk that walk and talk the talk. And so it was, on the final day of the Congress, when all was winding down, Deng Xiaoping dramatically appeared on stage, and together he stood side by side, with Jiang Zemin for an extended period of time while all the gathered official photographers took advantage of this great photo op, and the signal was clear. Deng stood with Jiang, and the torch was now officially passed. And one other thing, Deng picked a young 50-year-old guy to join Jiang Zemin in the standing committee. This man was Hu Jintao, and even as far back as 1992, the signal was that Hu Jintao would be groomed to be the heir apparent to Jiang. So Deng not only picked his successor, but his successor's successor too. And you know something? It wasn't perfect, but China has had two very decent decades since then. So China can't thank Deng for doing everything, but he definitely gets most of the credit. Chinese New Year 1994, Deng made his last public appearance. He was never seen again after that. He suffered from Parkinson's and other ailments common to most 90-year-olds. And that was it. No one except his family ever saw him again. Deng Xiaoping also died just after midnight on February 19, 1997. A good four and a half months before the handover of Hong Kong and 21 years after the death of his one-time mentor and tormentor, 
Mao Zedong. What is there to say? Except there was a great outpouring of grief. Jiang Zemin could hardly contain himself when he gave the eulogy for Deng. The accolades from around the world came in fast and furious. 10 a.m. on February 24th, the whole country held a three-minute period of silence in honor of their fallen leader. It was no surprise when Deng Xiaoping passed away. I mean, everyone knew he was ill and no one had seen or heard a peep since that day in 1994. You'd hear something every now and then from his daughter, Deng Nan, but not too much. So when he finally went quietly, no one could say they didn't see it coming. Per his last wishes, Deng donated all his vital organs to science, was cremated in a simple ceremony, and his ashes were scattered over the sea. As far as his legacy goes, you could get on a plane and fly to China and see for yourself. He didn't do too bad a job. He did what every leader since the time of the Qing dynasty Daoguang Emperor tried to do but couldn't. The Xianfeng, Tongzhi, Guangxu emperors couldn't do it. All the tragic and failed attempts to modernize, all the disrespect heaped on China. No one, not Sun Yat-sen, Jiang Kai-shek, no one had been successful in doing what Deng Xiaoping did. He's the guy who lifted China up, made it a wealthy nation, and showed the world that this nation, China, and its people were not to be taken lightly and never to be taken advantage of again. It was Deng Xiaoping who served as the grave digger responsible for burying all those ghosts of the late 1800s, early 1900s. Deng Xiaoping's life was truly a great story of lifelong service to China. Well, it took us eight parts, but finally we got through Ezra Vogel's biography of Deng Xiaoping. The last chapter of the book sort of summarizes how Deng transformed China. I was going to sort of review his whole life before we signed off, but who knows how much longer that's going to take to tie it all together. So let's just stop right here. And again, I urge all of you, if you can get your hands on that book or audio book, it's well worth it. I've only been skimming the surface. There are so many more fascinating details in Dung's life. Well, I hope y'all's enjoyed that. We'll do the same thing another day for Mao, Zhou Enlai, Liu Shaoqi, and other leaders. I think next time we'll maybe jump backwards in time and look at something a little older. Let me think about that. Well, signing off from sunny Claremont, California, this is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you all the best. And once again, I'm filled with nothing except the highest of hopes that I'll see you again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.